Come on. All right. I'm going to ask Lucy to read the scripture for us. So, please. Genesis 40, 1 to 23. You need a microphone, and here comes uh, Russ. Nah, you need that. Thank you. Hello. Yep. <laughs> it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with his own interpretation. And Joseph came in to them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner, when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness uh, to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream and there were three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from, from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the other, the, the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Was it? Hang the chief baker. Sorry if I said butler. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, you can keep that mic. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> 
Good morning, church. Yeah, good to see you all here. And, uh, you know, as I drive around Melbourne, I say, I think we're having an early winter. Yeah, do you believe that? <laughs> yeah. Some mornings are cold, but not as cold as Colorado, you know. Nothing. I don't wear gloves in winter here. So, <laughs> But today we are going to continue our study about the life of Joseph. Joseph, the son of Jacob. And this is Simon series number five. And I have titled it, Forgotten but Not Forsaken. Forgotten but Not Forsaken. God our Father, may your spirit help us. May your power flow. May your word be manifest. In the name of Jesus, amen. You know, Joseph's refusal in chapter 39 to lay with his master's wife resulted in false charges against him and he landed in Potiphar's jail. Many of us oftentimes find ourselves in jails of life around us. We sometimes are put in places where we think we are confined. Situations, circumstances, make it look like there's no way out. We feel shut up, shut off, and shut down. And sometimes we feel left to rot. There are times when we are in life's waiting rooms, like Joseph. We're going to visit him in prison. We're going to see that in this prison, he has duties to perform. There were dreams in the prison, but there were disappointments in the prison. The three good friends were stranded in the desert. Days passed, weeks passed, there was no help in sight. One day, one of the friends, the names were Juan, Lee, and Sifewe. Juan went out for a walk. As he walked along the sands, he found an oil lamp. He took the lamp, he rubbed it, and bam, came a genie. And the genie says, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Make any wish, and it will be granted. One was so excited, he said, oh, can my friends also make wishes? And the genie says, sure, each one of you can make one wish. One tells his friends, Lee and Sifewe. And Sifewe was the first. He goes, oh, I'm thinking about my country. How I wish I'll be back in Johannesburg. I love the mountains and the forest. Poof! He went. Eli thinks about his wife and children in Taipei, in Taiwan. And he says, oh, I wish to be back and enjoy the love of my family. Poof! He went. Juan is standing there, left alone. He looks around and he goes, oh, I'm missing my friends. 
I wish they were here. And puff, the genie went. You make wishes, you get promises, and sometimes you don't get them. Let's look at Joseph, his duties in prison. You know, the closing verse of 39 tells us that Joseph found favor in the eyes of the prison warden who turned over the running of the whole prison to Joseph. The first thing we notice about his duties is he was God's man on location. God's placement of Joseph in this particular prison. He said, wow. He had done nothing wrong. He's been lied upon. And by the way, let me say this. In Egypt, at that time, when you're accused of adultery or sins like that, your sentence is death. You wonder why Mr. Potiphar did not carry on that but sent Joseph to prison instead. Could it be that he did not believe his wife? I don't know. If he's going to be in heaven, that's one question I will ask him. But God placed Joseph in that particular prison. And my friends, God has placed you wherever you are. In a job, in a school, in a home. And he has a purpose in his will and in his overall plan for your life and my life. Why you and I are where we are. God's man on location. Joseph was in prison. But for him was the waiting room. You know, when you go to the doctors, right? We all have been in waiting rooms. And the one thing you want to hear is your name to go up. Well, it was God's man on location, but also the placement of Pharaoh's VIPs in this particular prison. The butler was Pharaoh's cupbearer. You remember a prominent cupbearer in the Old Testament? Nehemiah. The butler, the cupbearer, was the guy who brings the cup that has the wine or water to the king. And he will be the first to test it. So if there's poison in that drink, the toddler goes, and the king is saved. If anyone dies from poisoning, it will be the cup bearer by the very nature of their job. A cup bearer will be highly trusted servant of the king. That's one VIP put in the same prison as Joseph. Then there was the baker who would have been in charge of Pharaoh's kitchen to prepare his food and be the first to test the food before the king ate it. He too would have been a trusted servant of Pharaoh. He was placed in the same prison as Joseph. Hmm. God's man on location. But in that prison, Joseph was promoted. Instead of being an ordinary cellmate, Joseph had the responsibility of seeing to the needs of these two VIPs of Pharaoh. So he was God's man on promotion. On the surface, it would seem that this is just another assignment for Joseph. You remember, he was sold by his brothers, brought into the house of Potiphar. He was made head of the house. Look at this now. 
in a prison cell, he's been promoted to be like a supervisor also. This was not an ordinary cell mate. It was the providence of a sovereign God at work in Joseph's life. In this moment, God had just brought Joseph face to face with the one who will secure Joseph's release. So he was God's man on location, but he was God's man on promotion. Not just a cellmate, but one who rubbed shoulder with two VIPs of Pharaoh. And because of that promotion, we see God's expectation of service. From this point, we learn several things. One, we should never overlook or underestimate small twists and turns of life. You see, with the God that I serve, with the God of this book, there are no accidents for him. There are no coincidences for God when he's working in my life or working in your life. You will say, oh, well, Joseph just had another job. But God was working something. God would use this small matter into something great later on. In my life and in your life, there are no accidents when we are committed to God. When he is threading the spins of our lives, everything is in place. Nothing Nothing happens to you as a child of God. Nothing happens to me as a child of God that takes God by surprise. I may be surprised. I may be shocked. But he is not. What we might see sometimes as quote-unquote chance and coincidence may just be something that will later be great. In 1998, I was serving the Evangelical Fellowship of Sierra Leone as Director of Church Ministries. And our country was going through some brutal civil crisis that caused hundreds of people to be killed, slaughtered, and hundreds to be maimed. World Relief, the USA Christian organization, sent four men to come and help us assess the need of what was going on. And so four men came, and I happened to be one of the people who drove them around to see churches that were burned around the country and displaced camps. One of those men was Dr. Craig Williford. They spent 12 days in Sierra Leone, and we took them back to the airport and bid farewell. In 2002, I was accepted as a student at the Denver Seminary. And who was the president of that seminary? Dr. Williford. After I've registered, the church that helped us to go to America had given me scholarship to bring my children and my wife. And the seminary says they give 15% of tuition to foreign students who have been Christian leaders in their country. But one week after my registration, I was ushered into the office of the president, 
Dr. Williford. And we sat face to face. I, he was in, behind his desk. I was sitting there. And he goes, Tom Simbo. You know, and he had told this to other staff members that that name sounds familiar. And then when we met face to face, he said, do you remember me? I go, hmm, huh, no. I said, maybe, you know, I've been to several big conferences, Christian conferences. Maybe we met in the hallway one time. And he opens his drawer and takes out an album. And here were pictures of me and him and the team. Hmm. And then he said, well, we normally give 15% tuition, scholarship to students, African students, Christian leaders. But I am going to recommend 35% for you. Thank you, Lord. But that simple meeting in Sierra Leone, 1998, here I was, 2002, four years later, I am benefiting from that simple meeting. You say coincidence? I say no, the Lord was in it. It is the work of the Lord, and I marveled at it. Joseph, in prison, met with two of Pharaoh's VIPs. God was working something in his life. You see, by this time, Joseph had lost hope. He had dreamt of his brother serving him, his family serving him, and here he was languishing in jail for no wrongdoing. God is at work in our lives. You read Psalm 37, verse 23, Proverbs 16, 9, the Lord directs the paths of the righteous man. The Lord. So we see him at duty in prison, but there were dreams in prison. From verse 5 to 19, Joseph had been assigned the task of taking care of two special prisoners, Pharaoh's butler and baker. It seemed that Joseph not only took care of these men, but he had a close personal interaction with them, enough for him to notice something was wrong. As he came in one morning to attend them. So we see dreams in prison. By these dreams, the two men were dismayed. Dismayed by dreams. Joseph noticed in their countenance and realized that something was wrong. He said, why are you sad? In verse 8, why are you sad? Now the confidence which Joseph had gained over the days they have been together made it easy for these two VIPs to be honest with Joseph. Egyptians in those days, I don't know for now, Brother Solomon will tell us if that's wrong or not, but they had a strong belief that dreams foretell what was going to happen in the future. And so these two men were concerned. Here they were in prison, languishing. They had dreams, but there's no one to interpret their dreams. So that even adds to their worry. Hence their faces were sad. As far as they were concerned, their futures had been revealed to them in the dreams, but the dreams could not be interpreted. But thank God for a little boy called Joseph in that same prison. So we see dreams decoded by a man God has placed in that particular prison at that particular time. They tell Joseph their dreams. I'm sure when he heard about their dreams, he must have put his mind back to his own dreams in 37. 
His own dreams, however, look like, nah, they're not going to go anywhere. They have been derailed. They have been delayed for the time being. But in spite of Joseph's personal feelings, he knew God was the interpreter of dreams and he was prepared to say, Lord, you put me here. I'm your servant. I'm going to do your work. And so he decodes their dreams. He interprets their dreams. But says, just one favor. You see, the two men had the dreams. He interpreted them. He didn't ask the baker for any favor, but he asked the butler. That goes to a testimony of his faith in God that the butler was going to be released. And Joseph says, just one favor. Just one favor. Remember me. Remember me. You know, you go to the New Testament and you read about the thief on the cross. What did he tell Jesus? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He asked that favor. And of course, Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Joseph asked the favor of this VIP. And let's see what happens. So he decodes your dreams. But we have some lessons, some discipleship lessons from this incident. There was certain similarity between the dreams of the butler and the baker. The baker's dream also corresponded with his previous position under Pharaoh. But while the butler received good news, the baker's dream and interpretation was bad news. And Joseph, being the servant of God, was put in the position of telling them the interpretation. As a disciple of God, he had no business to edit, to change, or to sugarcoat the interpretation. So Joseph did just as God told him. Without fear, without hesitation. Yes, the baker's dream and interpretation was very graphic and cruel, but Joseph had to say it. The world thinks we Christians are cruel when we say sinners that don't accept the Lord will go to hell, and they say, what do you mean? How can a loving God send people to hell? Well, he's a loving God, but he's a just God. He says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And we as his disciples, we as his servants, should not minimize that. We shouldn't sugarcoat that. We should tell it as it is, plain and simple, that people should come to know the Lord and they will have eternal life. Joseph was in this position. If God gave the dreams, God is given interpretation, and Joseph as a disciple is just to do exactly that. No change, nothing. He spoke as God directed, and neither in his content nor in his tone did Joseph dare to edit his divine interpretation. Come to our next point. Disappointment from prison. So there were duties in prison, dreams in prison, disappointment from prison. After Joseph interprets the dreams, three days, the baker was killed. His head was lifted off. 
but the butler was released and reinstated. His head was lifted up. But we told in verse 23, the butler forgot Joseph. You see, we come back to that point where it says, don't put your trust in humans. The psalmist in David, in Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. As a child of God, the human resources that God makes available to us are great, but they have shortfalls. They have shortfalls. Disappointments from people. You know, we forget people, and people forget us. I'm grateful Dr. Williford did not forget our interaction in Sierra Leone. <laughs> he remembered but this butler did not remember Joseph. Surely, when Joseph went back to his cell room and the butler was freed, Joseph was thinking, Pai, you know, somebody some of these days is going to knock on my door and they're going to say, you're free. Days passed. Weeks passed. Months became two years. And Joseph must have been discouraged, in despair, another lost hope. Poor me. No. He stayed focused on his Lord. He stayed trusted in his Lord. Thank God. People can disappoint us. I can disappoint people. But God never disappoints. God will not forget you. In fact, he promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You may think in your little difficulty at home, in school, at work, on your farm, that God has forgotten you. You can be forsaken by your friends and family, co-workers, but if you're a child of God, you can be assured he knows you, he knows you, he knows about your need, and he knows about your problem. He cares. but he will not forget you. So the prison disappointment can teach us some things. And let us look at some of the lessons we can learn. Joseph learned from this experience, never put his confidence in human beings. Psalm 56, verse 11 Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. Psalm 146, verse 3. And a lesson for you and me. Never put your trust in human beings. Not even me. I can disappoint you. I can promise something or give me a call. And you call and I say, oh, sorry, I forgot all about it. But when I call on God, he's never too busy. Never. Never too busy. Just that tried to get help from human sources, but it failed him. And the fact is, there's no real help in us humans. We try sometimes, but there are circumstances that are beyond our control that make us not even fulfill our honest promises. Our help comes from the Lord. 
He may use humans as instruments, but behind the provision is his hand, the hand of the Almighty God. Joseph learned once again that God's unseen hands move us along hidden pathways of life. Sure, he would have liked to be freed immediately. But you see, God was working. God was working. In fact, we are told in Isaiah 50, chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, God says, I don't operate on your agenda or on your schedule. He says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Sometimes we wish God operates on our agenda, right? You know, we are praying about this. We are thinking about this. We want it to happen now, Lord. Yes. We've all come to that place where we say, God, I need it now. And he's there sitting, you know, like Jesus. It took him four days before he came to Lazarus. He was already in the grave. And this was his best friend. But what did he do? He raised him up. Sometimes God says, Yeah, Tom, you're going to go to the grave in that problem. I'm not going to bother you now. But you know, he always shows up. <laughs> you know, when I was working as a hospice chaplain, and my patients will ask me, Chaplain, how long is this going to go on? You know, when am I going to die? The doctor said, I got two weeks to leave. One of the phrases I always told them is, when your time comes to die, it will not be one minute early, it will not be one minute late. It will be according to Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed unto man once to die. That appointment, you don't fail. In the waiting rooms of life or the prisons of life, we can either get discouraged, look for a place to quit, to surrender, or we can act like Joseph. Wait and trust in the Lord. There will be times when we find ourselves in one confinement or waiting room of life. What we do there has a great deal to do with what the Lord does for us. What we do in the waiting rooms of life has a great deal to do with what He will do for us later in life. In the last lesson, Joseph was in prison. His dreams of becoming somebody may have been dashed, may have been delayed, but Joseph still had his faith and trust in the Lord, and the Lord did not forget him. See you next week. When we talk about Joseph from prison to palace, let's pray. Lord, you know each one of us. You know what we are going through in our different lives. With some of us, looks like we may be in prison, confined by problems and circumstances. Help us never to give up. Help us not to lose sight of your hand and your plan for our lives. Keep us truthful, faithful, and hopeful in you. Thank you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.